Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Isaac. And this is your boy, Bryce. And we are Brothers on Tennis. And folks, we've got a wonderful, wonderful interview with you today. You know our obsession with the film King Richard. We've got yet another player in that sequence uh, here today, and we are excited to talk to him. Bryce, I know you've got a lot of information on our guest, and I will pass it to you to share with our listeners. Uh, yes, I'm very excited today because we will be speaking with the screenwriter of King Richard, Mr. Zach Balin. And, you know, from everything that we've heard, uh, and we've talked to a lot of people about this movie and a lot of people about the making of this movie, the foundation of the success of this movie, the, one of the main reasons why it was even uh, possible to be made was because of the script. Uh, that Zach Balin wrote. So we get to hear from the man himself uh, how that was done, how that was received, and, and how that entire process was. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Zach to Brothers on Tennis. Hey, Zach. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. I should just warn you, my, my own kids are about to walk through and go to bed, so um, <laughs> there might be a little noise for a second, but... See Not guys, a thanks. problem. Good night, All right. kids. <laughs> all. Yeah. all right. Well, well, Zach, let's just start out, man. I mean, we've got this this incredible film that you you did the screenwriting for, and and I actually would like to to ask you just about your background. So, tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, what you know, what kind of got you into this this field of screenwriting, and and what brought you into the sport of tennis. Yeah, well, I'm, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, um, and I mean, sports were always a huge part of my life. So I, I played, I played football, basketball, baseball was my main three sports. And then I, when I, I went to college in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins, and I played baseball and football there. And then I started studying, um, studying film at, at Hopkins and sort of got into screenwriting while I was there. So that was, I mean, those, those two things kind of melded together while I was at, while I was in Baltimore. Um, but in terms of tennis, I mean, I had played, my dad was a very good tennis player. Um, he had played, actually he had, a, he had a kind of a strange, he had been a college baseball player at, at uh, UNC. And then when he, he's a psychologist and when he was getting his PhD, he played like tennis for, you know, he was 35 or something, but he played on the, on the team at, at his college, you know, he was the old guy, but wow. so he was a great athlete. So we used to go out and hit all the time. Um, and then the very first project that I ever sold as a screenwriter, it took me, you know, it took me a lot of years in New York. I was, I was doing other jobs within the, like within the film industry, but I wanted to write. And, um, but the very first thing like script I sold was a television show that was sort of like loosely based around Roger Federer, I would say. So really? I had done, you know, I started playing a lot of tennis in New York in, in my twenties and had become kind of obsessed with, with Federer. And, um, and so wrote, it's a very like strange script. You know, it was like a, it was like a Federer was, had gotten into a Tiger Woods-ish scandal um and but anyway i'd done a lot of research into tennis i'd really become obsessed with it and that certainly helped when i got involved with, with this project because i had a, i had a love for it but i also had a lot of i had a background where i i had i had played a lot but i had done i had spent a lot of time you know researching the sort of ins and outs of professional of the professional side of the sport I tell you what, you are talking to two of the biggest Federer fans uh, yeah. around. <laughs> Whatever happened to that script? I mean, is it was good. It like TNT bought it, um, and there was a the main other main character was was like his manager, and the manager at the time, Com Common had signed on to produce and play that role, so. Um, so I worked with him on it for a couple of years and 
I don't know, you know, things, a lot of scripts, you know, they sell and then they, there's like regime changes at the, at the networks and it never moved forward. But then Common and I tried to mount it again a couple of years later and sort of hit a couple of roadblocks. I would totally do it again. I thought it was a really good, it was a really good story, but oh, yeah. maybe, maybe, you, someone will, maybe someone will read it and, and want to, want to resurface it. You got to keep that one going, my friend. Yeah. Gotta keep cycling through that. If it's, if it's Roger Federer, we're in, put it back. I know. We Me are too. That's what <laughs> the end goal of all this stuff was to try to get on the court with Federer and it hasn't happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're probably pretty close now. Uh, <laughs> well, let, let's keep it going about the college years, though. So you're at John Hopkins University, and you're a two-time academic All-American uh, football. Uh, where does the film piece come in? Oh, you, you dug deep. You, you did the research, huh? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I had been kind of like a I mean, I think the two things that I was really interested in as a kid were sports and, and movies. And I would, you know, I would either be at a tennis court or on a baseball field somewhere, or I, I hung out a lot at this video store in my, in my neighborhood in Wilmington. And, um, and so I knew that I was, it was kind of a passion, but I didn't know what aspect of filmmaking I was interested in. Um, and then I was in school and I, I was at Hopkins and I took a, a screenwriting class just kind of on a whim and really fell in love with the, with the process. I mean, screenwriting is very specific. It has a different, you know, the format of it is kind of is strange and very restrictive. And there's, um, you know, there, there can be really, um, I mean, constrictive structural elements to writing a script. But I think those parameters to me, like, were were exciting. I, the the idea of writing a novel always seemed very daunting to me. It's so open ended, so many choices. But with a film, you really have you got to play in these lanes, and I, I liked that. And and then, you know, I didn't have I didn't have any connections in the film world coming out of college or getting into college. And that I that this was at a time where there was still the idea where you could you were hearing stories about people like Shane Black who wrote Lethal Weapon and kind of these big screenwriters who came out of nowhere and wrote a script and sold it for like 5 million bucks. And I was, you know, I think in the back of my mind somewhere, I was like, oh, that sounds pretty good. We should, I should do that. Um, and then, you know, and then I didn't sell a script for 15 years. But, um, but I think the idea that it was a, it was a way into the film industry that, was essentially free you know I, that the other aspects of you know of filmmaking that you're doing when you're just starting off and you're you're making short films with your friends and you're trying to mount or raise money to make your own first feature they that so it's a very expensive industry and and it very it's the threshold to entry is really high and so writing was always felt to me like a way where i could i could do it i could incubate something for free essentially and then try to have something really, really great that I could could take out and would be my calling card. And you know, and I had I had like encouraging aspects along the way. I think the first script I had written did it did get optioned eventually, and um, you know, never got made. I didn't really see much money out of it, but it at least was it gave me the confidence that I could. I don't know that you know that that I had enough of. I knew enough of what I was doing to keep at least keep trying to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. I, I'm curious, uh, Zach, in screenwriting, and you've been in, in that field for a, a, a very long time at this point, what are some of the things that you consider to be sort of the keys to success or kind of what, tell us what are the things that you've learned on this journey? Because again, we've got listeners and viewers and Again, as you know, we're brothers on tennis, so we've got people of color. And I think it's important that they hear someone successful like you. And, and what are those things that you feel you found as being, these, these are my foundation points to be successful in this particular field? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think, I think for me, so my trajectory, it took, you know, it took me a very long time to, to really 
break through in the industry in a meaningful way. And I had, I, for essentially for 15 years out of college, I, I worked in the set department in a lot of different film, film and television productions in New York. So I like built sets. I, um, I did props, which is like, you know, sort of supplying anything that the actors are, are touching or facilitating. But, um, but I, you know, in the background of all that, I was writing. And so certainly for me, there were, my biggest takeaway has just been that I didn't quit, that I, you know, I, that I really, I loved it. I really didn't want to do anything else. It was the one thing that, that I really felt strongly uh, that I both loved the process of it. And I liked what the idea of the, of the career could be. You know, so both the uh, ice, you know, writing is very isolating. So, you know, I, I enjoy doing that on my own, but I also like the collaboration of what happens when the script goes forward. And so, um, I mean, in some ways that, you know, I was just, I was determined and I, but I also, I, I really credit that I had built a, I had a, I had a job that enabled me to feel like, I had stability in my life that, that it, sorry, that I, um, you know, I certainly wasn't living lavishly, but I, but I felt like I was, had, was taking care of my responsibilities and, um, and that, I don't know, it made it, so it wasn't, in ways it was life or death for me, but it also, but I knew that there was like a foundation that I had as well. So that I think I, I, I look at a lot of my friends who have, you know, also have like artistic pursuits. And I think a lot of the ones that have been successful, cause it can, cause when you're pursuing something artistic or where there's, I don't know, sometimes it's just, it just comes down to luck that there's so many talented people out there who have great, great, you know, who are great musicians or great painters or great whatever and you still have to you still have to end up in the in the situation where your work can be recognized and that doesn't always happen and that having like a, a life that is going on at the same time I think was really important for me um so that and then just like you know I I was I I, I still am this way but I was very protective of the work that I submitted in that I never, I would work on something for, for a very long time before I would show it to anyone. I, where I was really like, I'm not going to show anyone anything that I think is half-assed. And, and I, and I kind of stick by that because I don't think you get that many chances to make like a first impression, especially in this industry. And that I, I know a lot of a lot of people where I get sent a lot of scripts now where, you know, someone says we read my script and I say, I, I had someone that did that to me and really helped me. And I, I want to be helpful in that way. But, you know, sometimes you read scripts and people haven't proofread them or they haven't, they haven't actually put in the work where it's like, this is professional. And I think it's very important to know that when you're putting your foot out there in the world that you like try to, you're putting your best foot forward. Right. So. And you know what must be a very difficult thing to, to, I guess, master or to own is when you have that kind of a mindset, you have to not get yourself in this analysis paralysis, right? You have to be able to reach a point where you understand that your product is ready to go and you just don't spend like extra time making minute changes and and never really completing and never really okay. compute never really being ready to i mean there's some of this in like in richard williams i think but the never like at some point you have to play your cards right. and i so i think it is it's having confidence that you you believe you have an instinct in what you're doing and you know when it's when it's going to be done when it's ready to be shown and yeah you can i think there's a kind of an adage in film, you know, that films are never completed. They're just abandoned. And <laughs> that, cause you can keep tinkering with all these things forever, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's right. And, 
Um, and so, but I think it, you, you know, you have to trust your own taste and your own instinct to say, okay, like, I, I believe that this is really good now. And I know that like, I didn't, I spent enough time with it to like, that that's not a whim that, you know, that I've, I've sat in that decision for long enough to say, like, I really believe in this. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you have to, at some point you got to put your, put it out in the world, whatever it is. And, um, because yeah, it can become paralyzing. Right. And I just wanted to follow up on something else that you said when you were talking about, maybe you need a little bit of luck and, and I don't know, I wasn't going to say luck. I was going to say fate or, you know, something <laughs> like that, but you know, let's transition a little bit into the King Richard project. And so, as you know, we've already talked to producer Tim White. And so he talked to us about that meeting that you guys had in 2017, where I, I, I'm gonna let you tell our, yes. our audience uh, that story. Yeah, so essentially I had a, I had a general meeting, which, is, which in, in the film industry is like, uh, you get set up on a lot of blind dates essentially with producers who have ideas or they have, or you have a script or a story that you're interested in finding a producer for. And I had a meeting with, with this guy, Tim White, who, you know, hopefully people have seen this one. And we were in New York and we had met for about an hour in like a hotel lobby talking about a variety of different ideas that he was working on or that I was working on. And then we were just going to say goodbye. And it had been like a, you know, nice to meet you. Hope maybe we'll, maybe we'll find something in the future. And as I was leaving the meeting, I mentioned to him that I was, I was on my way to the U.S. Open. Um, so that was September of 2017 and Tim was like, well, if you like tennis, you know, give me five more minutes. Cause I have this movie idea that I've been trying to figure out for like for a long time. And I sat back down and that was, he said, what do you know about Richard Williams and, and Venus and Serena? And I, you know, and that was the beginning. So it was, that was extremely I mean, the, I, we think Tim and I talk about that all the time that just the, if I had never said I was going to the open, that idea never comes up and, um, and that, you know, a lot of things had to go right at that moment for, for that idea to be brought up. And it was then for me, it was, it was pretty immediate that when he said it, I, you know, I knew the Williams family story just from being a tennis fan. Um, I knew about Richard peripherally, just I'm sure as, you know, as, as anyone watching watching those matches in those years had, but I I didn't really know the details or I didn't remember them. And then I went home that weekend. I basically said like, don't hire anyone else for this. Give me a, I know this is a huge idea and this could be an incredible movie. Like give me a weekend to try and figure out what I think the, the story would be. Cause obviously when you're telling someone's life, you could say, Let's start it with when Richard is born in Shreveport and it ends in, you know, it ends now or it's the whole thing is, um, you know, is about Indian Wells or something, you know, it could be any, could be any aspect of their life. But um, I went home on a weekend and I read Richard's book and I read Macy's book and I read Serena's book. Everyone wrote a book and, I, you know, and sort of found pr pretty quickly found the window of what is, is the movie now and said, I think. I think this is the time frame that we should we should focus on and, and tell their story through. And and Tim and his brother Trevor said, okay, like let's let's take a shot. That's amazing. <laughs> it I was mean, crazy. I, honestly, it's never happened for me like that before. One that like, you know, someone tells you an idea and you're like, this is the greatest idea for a movie, for a movie <laughs> I've ever heard. And then that what the movie should be arrives with real clarity from the beginning and that that happened for me but it, usually it usually it doesn't and it takes you know you're just chipping away and chipping away and trying to figure out you know you know you have the kernel of something but you don't know what which path the story is going to take or what you want to focus on and this this was i don't know just it was just like sitting there it, very clear from the from the beginning Fate. Fate, exactly. Yeah. Zach, I have a question. So had you done that Roger Federer piece 
before or after this came I had done it before, you. but Tim had never read it. He didn't know about that. And that's my question to you. How, how did you, I guess, because you've, you've gone on this path, you were doing the Federer thing, and you know you pitched it, it got out there, it didn't quite jump off the way you were expecting. And then you get introduced <laughs> to this story and you're talking to Tim and Trevor. How do you keep your, your, I guess the, not the focus, but how do you, I guess, I, I got, I can't put this into words, but how do you motivate yourself to be able to invest in another story that's similar to, since both of them are kind of the goats. Well, even though we're talking about Richard, of course, but how do you get, you know, how, do, how did you, I guess, motivate yourself to say, this is the project that can, can go the distance, if you will. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not afraid yeah, of my question. Yeah, I, mean, I, think it was, but... there were, I think there were a lot of aspects of it. One, that you know, probably since that television project hadn't gone, hadn't moved forward, that, I felt like there was a lot within the tennis world, within just a story about ambition and what it means and or takes to be a champion, you know, what what that kind of dedication does to someone or does to a family, that there was a lot that I had wanted to investigate with that in the television show that, you know, ha I hadn't gotten to write about. So when, it, when another opportunity came that was in the same world, I didn't feel burnt out about it. I was actually excited, you know, that, that there were ideas in there that I was actually, that I was going to get to talk about now. Um, and then, I don't know, the second part of your question uh, that this one was like a real lightning bolt. Just, I was like, this was when Tim talked about it from the beginning, I had real clarity that this was an idea that I, I should stop everything else I'm doing and put all other like prospects aside and, and try and get it because they, Tim would know this better, but they, I believe they had already, they were down the road with another writer. So I had to, you know, at least get them to pump the brakes on that a little bit. And I knew that I, I knew that I had a short window to convince them that I, you know, I could tell the story. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, maybe I, I might have lost the train of thought of your, the previous part of your question, but I think anytime it's, it's a really hard decision to know most times like which, which paths and, and stories to follow because just because, just because it, it specifically with true stories, I, I, I write now a lot of true stories that like you see someone has a really incredible life, is, has gone through harrowing things or has achieved incredible things and, and they're inspirational it doesn't necessarily mean that there's like this that 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 you, you can hang the structure of a movie on those stories so i think you know it's maybe some of that is just is just practice at this point to know that like okay does does this life have what it takes to sustain a narrative a dramatic arc so to walk us through the process, somehow you then go from delivering something to Tim. Uh, Tim remains excited. And at some point, I'm assuming you, you present to the family. And how was that received? Yeah, so this one had a kind of an unusual trajectory, but essentially like I came back from Tim that weekend and I said, here's what I think the movie should be. And him and his brother said, okay, like, let's, let's do this. And then it wasn't, they weren't like hiding the boat on this, but essentially I knew this going in, but, but they didn't have the rights to the story. Mm. And, you know, we knew that for the movie to be successful, both, both creatively because we needed access to their stories, but also from a like commercial standpoint that, we would we wanted the family's involvement um so but probably like you know me i had i hadn't had a movie made i'm a white guy that's like maybe maybe i'm not the guy that if we went to them and said we want to make their tell their story that i was going to be the person that they were going to select to to do that and so collectively we said okay the, probably the best way to to advocate for that 
you know, that we could be really good partners in this is to just write a great script and take the script to the family and say like, you know, it's not abstract. This is exactly what we, what we think the movie can be. And, you know, we'd love your participation and your, and your, you know, uh, endorsement to, to move forward. So essentially that's what we did. So I took about four or five months. I researched everything I could without speaking to them. Um, you know, I read all those books. I read, there was tons of, Richard had done tons of interviews in the, you know, and, um, and so I wrote the first draft of the script. And then when that was complete and we felt good about it, um, we sent it to like, basically we sent it to Will Smith and, um, and, you know, amazingly, he said that he was interested to do it. He would, he would like to be involved in it if the family was going to come on board. And then, you know, really Tim and Trevor and I then went on a long process of trying to get the script in front of Venus and Serena. Um, and eventually we were able to make contact with Isha Price, who, I, you know, hopefully you're going to talk to. And Isha, Isha agreed to meet us at the 2018 U.S. Open. So the following year from, from when I sat down with Tim, I think it was the year that Serena was was ultimately played in the final against Osaka. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Venus and Serena were playing on the same day. You know, they'd been lined up that they both were playing Monday and they'd off Tuesday went. So the first Tuesday, Isha, we had lunch with Isha and we brought her the script and she said, you know, I probably won't, we probably won't do this, but I'll take a look at the script. And then, <laughs> Um, and that was, you know, that was a year after everything. And, you know, the script had already had already been getting some buzz. We had Will, can, you know, potentially. And um, but then it was a really long couple of days waiting to hear back from Isha. And um, but, you know, she called a couple of days later and said, OK, like we, we like the script. There's some things we think you got wrong. There's some things that are like inaccurate. Um, but we if you're willing to like sit down and hear our stories and interview us and do all that, then, then we'll like, we'll, we'll do this with you, which was, in, I mean, it was incredible. And so then for the net, for the rest of those two weeks of that U S open every off day, we sat with Isha and Orsine and, you know, Venus would call in and, um, and we went through the script and we interviewed them. And, um, and by the end of that, those two weeks, they essentially said, okay, let's, let's do this together. And then Tim and I, Tim and I went to, then Tim and I got this, they invited us and we sat in the family box at the finals, that Osaka final. Wow. That was crazy. <laughs> so. Zach, that's insane, man. <laughs> it was insane. I remember, oh my I remember, I mean, I, you know, I had been to the U.S. Open, whatever, every year for 15 years or something, but, you know, in like nosebleeds. And then, <laughs> um, and then I remember on that final, we walked up and you go to like the will call booth and I was like, I don't know, there's a ticket for me, I think. And they're like, who's it under? And I'm like, I, I'm like, I think it's under Serena Williams. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I remember then they like, someone's like, yep, we got it here. And Man. then I remember it was a, this is crazy, but I like, those tickets are different. So you're like, I, you know, I had this ticket. I went to like just the front door of Arthur Ashe and I was like, you know, I have this ticket and like the security guard stopped me at that point. And they're like, where'd you get this thing? And I'm like, I was like, Serena, Serena gave it to me. And they like, they're like, are you sure you don't seem like you know how to use this ticket? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I've never that is it. And they're like, well, because I was supposed to like the ticket for those tickets, I was supposed to like go in the, you know, whatever, like the player's entrance or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was all very crazy. That is so hilarious, yeah. Zach. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, it, I, I, I have to ask you a, just a, a, a personal question, because again, you being the screenwriter, this is, a, this is your, I mean, you're the one that basically got them to engage how how must that have felt when you not only got 
a Will Smith to say, yeah, I like this script. But then you get all of these people, you hearing the buzz and you actually present it to the family. Each is basically transparent with you and says, we likely won't do this, but yeah, I'll take it. And they actually engage. That speaks volumes as it relates to what you presented. I mean, you had, I, bro, you had to put your chest out a little bit. I mean, yeah, a little bit. I mean, a little bit. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I felt very good during those during those times. It was a really <laughs> long. Pro- I mean, you know, I had confidence that the script was really good. When I finished it, I remember telling Tim and Trevor, I was like, "This is this is the best thing I've ever written." And I don't know what'll happen. I don't know if we will. I don't know if we'll be able to open all the doors that we, that we need to for the movie to get made, but like, this thing's good. And, um, you know, and like, thankfully that continued to be like the reception. Um, but it was different, certainly different taking it to the family because, you know, it was, it was their lives. It was their, you know, the, it was their voices. It was their, their experiences. And if anyone was going to, call bs on any of it and they it was going to be them and so it was i don't know yeah I, in some ways i still can't really believe that the that it that they read it and they said this this feels like us you know i think you obviously there were things that that they said do not but for the you know for the majority of it they said you know you got it right and not nah, felt great <laughs> and i was yeah we were i was I was partying in that box at the. At the <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were. Yeah. So my question for you is: so as the writer now, you have to sit down and you know meet with the different members of the family, getting their perspectives, getting that all right. Of the perceptions you had going into this project, what were some of the things that? maybe surprised you as you got a chance to learn Venus and Richard and Serena and Orsine and Isha? Yeah. I mean, you know, different aspects of all of them. I think that, you know, probably for, for me with Richard, there were two things. I didn't know anything about Richard's past. You know, I didn't, before I started researching the movie, I, maybe I knew he was from, from the South, but I had no idea what his experiences were growing up. Um, and that was, that was really the key for me from the beginning was once I read about what Richard's childhood had been like in Shreveport and, you know, how he faced the most incredible racism, like imaginable, the most incredible poverty. Um, you know, he didn't have, he didn't have, he didn't have plumbing in a house until he was 18 when he moved to Chicago. Um. And that anything that, I don't know, anything that anyone felt or said about Richard once he had, once he was a public figure, I sort of threw out the door because I said, when I had felt like I had at some grasp of what his experience had been, I just felt like I will go on a ride with this guy, whatever he does, you know? And so that was, and I felt like if I could put an audience in, in, his, in those shoes, then they would really change their perspective about, about him. Because obviously, you know, Richard was, a, was seen as a controversial figure, you know. And there, look, there are aspects of Richard's, like, personality just, like, out of the gate that are controversial. Like he, but, I, but a lot of the things that he was getting knocked for, in retrospect, you look back and say, like, he was people were judging him very blindly. And um, so that was, you know, for me, that was just a a really huge entry point into, into trying to understand who he was. And then just, just, I think the idea of how soft and enthusiastic a coach he was to Venus and Serena that, you know, you look at other people like, well, I don't know, you guys have probably read, Agassiz's book or um you know or Earl Woods or I don't know any any of these kind of domineering sports dads and that they can present as maybe friendlier to the outside public and then on the court with their kids they're like you know get it done and so I I probably assume that's what Richard was like but that he was very the opposite like he was he was a really gentle coach 
and a, a very like gentle father. So I think that to me, that was the biggest discovery that I made about him. And then, you know, with, with Orsine, just the, the biggest stuff I changed in the script once I met with them was it was Orsine and just realizing, cause she had been, you know, she wasn't a very forward facing person in the public eye. She was not interested in that. Um, and so I think her role within the family had not been as well documented, but also, you know, she was on the court with them every day. Like, so she, the two, I mean, it's all, it's all insane, but the, Richard had never played tennis before, you know, until 1978. And he, he, sent away and got all these, you know, tapes in the mail and taught himself to play tennis, basically watching VHS tapes, but then also going to local courts and just anyone that would hit with him. And then he learned and then he taught Orsine. And so then once they learned, then they jointly would, you know, she would be on one court with Serena and he would be on one with Venus or they'd swap. And so just, you know, that, that she really was an integral part of their coaching, um, you know, was a big, was a big revelation. And then, I, I don't know, I think people, other people probably knew this and I didn't, but just that Venus and Serena, how, how close they were, you know, I think that the way they'd been covered in the press when they were playing, you know, the, their matches, when they would play each other, like people really got on them from not, like, not going a hundred. I think there was a perception that they took it easy on each other or that, where that Richard was fixing the matches or something and all that stuff seems to be BS to me, but that I think it was complicated for them because they're really, really close. And so I think it was, I don't think there was anything premeditated in any time they played, but I think they, they really look out for each other. And um, I think, you know, we wanted to make sure that we showed that in the script, like how, even though Venus was, you know, Venus had the spotlight all those years, which is kind of forgotten now, but, um, but she really looked out for Serena and, and wanted to give her a due and, and is, I, I'm sh sure it's complicated when you're both so at that tier of something, but that day, as much as you could be a, I, I don't know, you, tell, you hear about all these athletes that how singular, how single-minded you need to be to be excellent, to be the top, but then having your sister be there with you and like, but still have the drive to be the best, but also wanting them to be the best. It's a really complicated dynamic. And um, yeah, so we, we tried to get that in there. Well, you definitely did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you right. definitely did. Um, and, and I mean, just, it, again, just I can't even imagine how you kind of had to adjust and change and, just, you know, coming in and, and again, hearing the different stories. I guess I'm curious, Zach, to, to, to hear from you. What do you feel were the biggest challenges for you when you came in, you actually did start hearing the true story? What, what was the challenge as far as what you had written in the in initial screenwriting and adjusting to be able to fit in the actuals? that they shared with you? Yeah, actually it wasn't, I mean, it, it was really work within scenes and not so much like, you know, I knew the facts. So the, the, like the plot points of their story and what the turning points in their careers and decisions they made were pretty well documented. So like, luckily that stuff didn't, didn't need to change. It was more, um, you know, it was more the intimate moments of like, okay, what was it, what was it like when Richard and Orsin were alone? You know, were they supportive of each other? Were they combative? Were, was, were they communicating and making these decisions together? Or was Richard just, you know, flying, flying loose? And so it was, I think for the most part, the, the architecture of the movie remained the same. The scenes were there, but it was, it was just um, sort of tweaking with the levels of how people would have reacted to certain to certain decisions. I mean, there was, I, I think, I mean, I've told the story a few times, but like, you know, there's a scene at the end of the movie or towards the end of the movie where um, there's a big fight in the kitchen where 
war scene kind of finally confronts or airs her grievances with Richard over, you know, Richard had had a family before this, before he met Orsine and, um, and that was always in the script and, but not in that moment in the story. And Orsine, the real woman read the script and, and was like, oh, you're gonna, you, this is gonna be in the movie. And I was like, I, you know, I really think it needs to be in the movie. It's gonna, if we want the movie to be authentic, we, we can't shy away from the things that, you know, were complicated or, or controversial or problematic. And, and she said, okay, well, if, if, if it's gonna be here, let me tell you actually how I found out about it. And, and let me tell you how, what my feelings were and, you know, when I talked about it with my children and all those things. And so what's in the movie now is almost verbatim what she told me. And so it was wow. things like that where like, I knew that there were, I knew the events, but I didn't necessarily know maybe the way they affected people and what their emotions were. And so, you know, then it became about, you know, just finding how to make those dramatic and put them in, in and put them in. And then, um, but to, I mean, to the Williams family credit, they never really, they, when they came on, they didn't ask us to like, can you take this out? Can you not say this about Richard? Can you, if anything, the main thing that they really were like, this needs to be in the movie is that our mother was a huge part of this journey. And so that, that probably took the most, that was the most part of the changes was just making sure that we followed Orsine's story in a way that felt representative to them. And I tell you, I, I, I mean, as much as we hear comments about Will and his portrayal of Richard, we were blown away by Anjanou Ellis because what She's we great. loved about what she did is she really embodied the essence of Orsine. You're so used to seeing Orsine in the box and kind of the looks and the glances and just, she can do a slight whatever. She picked up on all those subtleties and it was, you know, it was like we were watching or a scene there, you know, on screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you said it. Yeah. Anjanou was amazing. She killed it. And she like, she brought, I think like or scene, you know, she can, she can do a lot with, without saying very much. And, and I think that was actually the hardest thing about writing or scene was that she's, she's very, um, She's not, not quiet, but she, she waits to speak until she really wants to. And then when she speaks, it's like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but that can be hard in the script because then it doesn't always feel like, you know, you're reading all this dialogue of everyone else and you're like, oh, she hasn't said anything in a while. Is she a, more, is she a minor character? And making sure that her screen presence felt as powerful and important as her role was, you know, was was tricky because she we knew she wasn't going to have like the long bits of dialogue and monologues that that Will and Richard were going to have um but no Anjanu you know she killed it and then and when there's that time jump in the movie you know that picks up three years later or so and her hair has changed to this you know she has these like kind of blonde little little <laughs> braids and, and all of a sudden you're like oh okay yeah I know exactly who this is and, we didn't get her in the in the box with like the big glasses. <laughs> <laughs> we would have loved that. We would have yeah. absolutely loved that. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> so, let's, yeah. so let's let, let's talk about the script again. So you, you say you felt like this was the best script you had ever written. Clearly, other people were on board because we understand like before the the movie was even, the script was even officially picked up to be produced. It was number two on, what do they call it? The blacklist? We're not familiar with what that. The blacklist uh, is like a, um, it's a end of the year, like list that film executives in Hollywood sort of vote on the scripts that they read during the course of that year that they thought that have not been produced yet, but they thought were, you know, the best scripts that they'd read of that year. And so it's sort of an annual, like, it's an annual best of list of scripts that they hope will be made at some point. And yeah, we ended up number two. It was very, it was cool. Wow. So that, at that point, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. 
No, at so that I'm point, had you gotten. <laughs> go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. At, at that point, had you gotten sign off from the Williams family uh, at the at, at the end of that year when it was number two? I think or we were close. Still- I think it. I don't know that we had like finished paperwork and stuff, but I think you know that happened. My recollection that happened December. Reckless comes out in December, so that must have been December of 2018. And then we had been with them at the U.S. Open in September of 2018. So they were already like on board, but we hadn't we hadn't yet like finalized everything enough that we could take it out to like studios as a like a package to sell. And. Yeah. And in, in terms of a current state, and I could be wrong, my numbers could be off, but you have so far been nominated, is it 11 times for best original screenplay for, including the Academy Awards and the Writers Guild of America? I don't know about the number of it, but yes, the Oscars got nominated the, and the Writers Guild, and then I got nominated for BAFTA, the British Film Awards, uh-huh. um, and Critics' Choice, and Hollywood Critics Association, and you have to send me your list. That sounds better. Than oh, <laughs> okay. So, so, so I'm gonna get a little. I'm gonna get a little spicy with you right now. Yeah. Th- th- there's one that I was looking for in that list that I didn't see, and I didn't see the Golden Globes there. Now, my, my assumption is is when I see you're nominated for an Oscar and Writers Guild and Critics' Choice and all that. How, how does the Golden Globes get missed? I, the Golden Globes were sort of a, this is like a off year or two for them. You know, they have, they've <laughs> kind of, not because I wasn't involved, but because, <laughs> you know, they, they, they're not having a tele, they didn't have a telecast this year. They, the, I think they're going through some like reformation because it came out in the, in the the last several years that they didn't have it extremely an extreme lack of diversity in their right. voting body so i think there was a feeling hollywood as a whole kind of pulled back from them and said you gotta like you know get yourself together and then come back and so so there they did make nominations this year will i think will won but it wasn't a big televised event and and so that's one reason all the other thing is that that the Oscars nominate 10 screenplays and the Golden Globes nominate five. So I don't know. Okay. I'm happy to be in any of them. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> That's right. I mean, no. Zach, when it, when, it, when it started rolling in and you started hearing all of these nominations. Talk to us about how you felt, man. I mean, how, how, what is that experience? I mean, it's incredible. Un, un, there's no real way to like, to put into words, like how gratifying it really is. Cause I think, you know, for me as a writer, um, that's, it's kind of, that's feels like kind of the peak of, of recognition. Um, but also, you know, I'm like the other people in the, who are nominated in the category that I'm in are like legitimately my heroes. Like it would be like not being nominated next to like Nadal and Federer and Tommy Haas <laughs> and whoever. Like it's you know, it's Paul Thomas Anderson who has licorice pizza, but he directed wrote and directed Boogie Nights and There Will Be Blood and um, Adam McKay. You know, just people that I like truly as I was deciding that I wanted to write I was like reading these people's scripts so um just to have like a mention of my name among those people is like okay like I'm that's that in some ways that's enough and I I feel like it it validates a lot of things (laughs) for me so that's that's awesome um and no, I mean, just like that the movie, it's like recognition that the movie is reaching people. And even though, it was, you know, it's a tricky year for movies, people, our movie initially was supposed to be in theaters and like solely in theaters. And then once the pandemic hit, 
all the Warner Brothers movies of this year moved on to, so they would be on HBO Max on the same, the same time. Um, which, so, you know, our movie didn't have a tremendous box office. So you kind of, you, you lose a little bit of the idea of like, was, did people love this movie? Were they seeing it? We don't really know, but the, the reception and the award circuit, and then also you just like, you know, scrolling Twitter and whatever, just realizing like, oh yeah, people really, people saw the movie and they really like, a lot of people really love it. And it's, it's been moving to people and that stuff has been extremely, extremely gratifying and just, um well because also we felt a huge responsibility with this story that it wasn't it wasn't just some some whim some made-up idea we knew that it was that it should be great and if we effed that up it would be on us and we would have blown a real opportunity to, to make something that could be really impactful and inspiring to people and you you know you don't get a second chance to do that so when you kill a project like this, right? When you just smash it and it's, you know, you kill it, right? What's next for Zach Balin? I mean, what, you know, I'm sure other opportunities are coming as a result of how well uh, the King Richard film has been received. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's opened a lot of doors. It's been great. Uh, so this happened before the movie came out, but I think, you know, because of that script, I got hired to write the next Creed movie, the boxing movies with, with Michael B. Jordan. Um, so that's actually, I wrote, I wrote that. And then I, then I teamed up with this guy, Keenan Kugler, who's a young writer, who's um, Ryan Kugler's brother. And we did the, the later drafts of the script together. And that's shooting in Atlanta right now. And um, Michael is, Michael B. Jordan's directing it as well. Um, so that should be really good. And then Ray Green, who I hope, I think you're talking to soon, um, right. uh -huh. who was the director of King Richard. We became, you know, good friends over this. And, um, and he got hired to direct a movie about Bob Marley for Paramount. Wow. All right. Um, and he very generously brought me in to help, to help write that. So I, nice. I've been working on that with him. Um, so no, it's been, you know, it's been it's been it's been awesome it's like really it opened a lot of doors and you know and it also opened a lot of doors into the kind of films that like i want to make because it's you know it's hard to make movies for adults right now that they're i mean you know i i am excited to go see batman i'm excited for all those movies but i think i'm i i want to write movies that are feel truthful and dramatic and they those aren't necessarily the things that are like burning up the box office at the moment, but that this, this gives me a, a little bit of a window to at least like try to convince people to, to go on, to get on board with it, with some of those stories. Absolutely. What, what, what is kind of like a little pet project that you have, Zach, that you're kind of thinking about that's kind of that nugget in the back of your head? Um, well, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that are percolating. My wife and I, have, we have got a little production company and we have a story that we've been working on together for a long time about, <clears throat> about a restaurant in New York that we spent a lot of time in, but it's kind of a, kind of a crime thriller in a restaurant. Um, All right. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that. And then, um, no, you know, a lot of things we're like, we're very fortunate at the moment that we can, can get some things out there, but also hoping that this opens some, you know, some tennis doors and better yeah. come fall in and get to get to hit with him when he's back. If he wants to, <laughs> I don't know if he listens uh, to this, but you know. we're going to, we're going to request that he, there's a doubles match there and <laughs> you invite uh, two brothers to come out there and to, um, hit with you and Roger. Yeah, I think that's what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll do that. <laughs> I'll tell you like the biggest perk of the whole movie is that like I said, you know, Tim White, who was the producer, Tim was like a top 50 junior or something, you know. Right. And he's much better tennis player than I am. But he would often be like, oh, why don't you come out and we can like hit on a Saturday. And then he's like, I might have some notes on the script I want you to do. But he's like, just hit with me for an hour and then we'll talk about things. So 
I got a lot of free, like, you know, hitting with much better players than I would have before. And the, um, the guy who, who essentially taught the actresses, Demi and Sanaya, who play Venus and Sarita, <clears throat> who taught them to play tennis was this guy named Eric Taino, who Eric was a top 200 pro who beat Federer in a pro match. Wow. Wow. And, I th- and I think, I think Eric was like number one singles at UCLA in the, okay. you know, in the nineties. And um, anyway, he was, so he was on set every day and then I would just like bring my racket and make Eric hit with me at lunchtime. <laughs> and so that's the biggest, uh, that, you know, if I could just keep writing tennis movies where they let me, where they <laughs> had to force the coaches to, to hit with me at lunch, that would be, that would be enough. Awesome. We'll see Zach on the tour after this, man. Come on. I know, right? I played, <laughs> I played this morning. I played so bad. I was like, I'm, I'm getting worse the more I play, I think. <laughs> I, I feel like I can relate to that, honestly. Yeah. Definitely. Oh. <laughs> So, Zach, look, we are so appreciative that you took this time to speak with us. This has been just a fun and informative uh, and great interview. Um, You know, we wish you the absolute best. And, hey, we will be following you. And if you do some more tennis stuff, you have to make sure you tap into us. (laughs) You know, we'd love to check you out and see what's going on. I will, for sure. It was so great to talk to you guys. Thank you for supporting the movie. And um, it was, so it was, it was fun to be here. Hopefully we can do it again. Absolutely. We, we would love that, Zach. We would love that. Right. Yeah. So, uh, Isaac, this has been another good one. So we're going to go ahead and sign off here. But uh, listeners, we hope that you're enjoying this behind the scenes series we're having with King Richard. Uh, and we have some more interesting interviews coming up for you. So definitely stay tuned. So on behalf of the podcast, this has been your boy, Bryce. And this is your boy, Isaac. And we are Brothers on Tennis. Everyone take care. <laughs>